Hello and welcome to our viewers and to our guest today, Professor Evelyn Welch, University of Bristol's Vice Chancellor and President. I'm Adam Michael, Bristol SU's Union Affairs Officer, and I look after democracy and representation in Bristol SU. And I make sure that students are at the heart of the union's decision making. I'm joined also by the Sport and Student Development Officer, Lucy Matthews. Hello, I'm Lucy. I look after sports societies and student groups to make sure they're represented throughout the university, SU and beyond. Evelyn, thank you so much for joining our In Conversation With session today. In a few words, would you maybe be able to explain to any students that might not know what your role involves and how your first few months as Vice Chancellor has been? Adam, Lucy, and to the whole Students' Union, thank you so much for having me. I'm about 10, 11 weeks in. I'm the university's president and vice chancellor. And that role involves um, leading the university. I lead it in a way which is like the Students' Union, um, a place where we listen to all voices, but also have to make difficult choices. I am, in very practical terms, the chief accountable officer to the government, to our funders and to our council for our academic affairs and for the way we run the university. So I need to make sure that we are a well-run, effective university that works for our students, that works for our staff and works for our broader community. I love it here. It's absolutely fantastic. And I particularly love it because I love working with you guys at the Students' Union and with all of our students across the university. Thanks, Evelyn. We know that you've spoken widely about wanting to connect directly with the students at Bristol University to listen to their feedback and concerns. We're so pleased to have you here today and given the opportunity to put questions straight to the Vice-Chancellor at Bristol University. The elected officer team have spoken to lots of students and we put a wider call out to any questions through the SU social media channels and collected the most important topics for right now for students. Shall we jump straight into it? Go on. Strikes have been a big subject over the last few weeks. Will you be agreeing to UCU's demands so that students can get the education that they pay for? Strikes have been going on for almost three, four years now, and I'm really aware that for some students they had strikes, then COVID, and now strikes again. I'm really aware of it. I'm really sorry about it. Strikes are taking place both by UCU and Unison colleagues. They are taking place at national level. So I as a vice chancellor have a voice in this, but so too over a hundred universities and a hundred university vice chancellors. We need to resolve this at national level, doing what we can locally, but it's complicated. Pay issues, pension issues, all kinds of other issues around terms and conditions, none of which can be resolved simply here at Bristol because they all have to be negotiated nationally. This is very damaging for students. It's damaging for staff as well. So I'm very hopeful that if all sides can seek compromise, we can move forward so we can deliver the education that students deserve and that staff really want to provide? Follow-up question to that. Some students have faced industrial action throughout each year of their degree. How are you mitigating the impact on their education? Some students have faced industrial action, COVID, and then industrial action again. I'm really, really sorry about this. Locally, we are genuinely doing what we can, both to solve the root issues around pay and pensions and working conditions. But for students, we do need to mitigate. So to make sure that what's happening has the limited impact on their learning and on their experience of university. So for example, at local levels, heads of school will be looking at what does that program involve? What have you missed? How can we make sure you get that learning? Um, or in worst case scenario, if you're not able to catch up on that, to make sure that you're not assessed on it. So we will make sure that your learning is impacted as minimally as possible, but we will need to work with you to understand what that impact has been. 
Right, thank you for that. And on to a different question now. As you're aware, inclusive well-being is one of our officer priorities this year. So how can we ensure students are getting the specialized support that they need in relation to both physical and mental health? So that's such an important issue. And the University of Bristol and I personally share that commitment to inclusive well-being. As you may know, and as I hope all the students know, we've invested heavily in our well-being services and our mental health services in our ability to make sure that any student, whatever their needs, whatever their background, has the ability to talk to somebody quickly and resolve problems rapidly. So we're not perfect and we can always do more, but this is a really, really core priority for the university as well as the students' union. More broadly, we need to ensure that we are a truly inclusive community so that people don't feel that whatever their identities are, that they have a place to go to, people to speak to, and, a, a, and feel that they're part of a University of Bristol who accepts them, embraces them, learns from them, whatever their background, whatever their identity. Thank you, Evelyn. With a mass population displacement occurring in many countries across the globe, we had a question about the university taking a lot of money from companies involved with arms and armament. How do you feel about this? So that's a really interesting and complex question. And I hope we can have an open discussion with staff and students and our broader community here in Bristol. There's been sometimes a sort of sense that um, taking money from a company like Rolls-Royce or BAE means you've taken money, blood money. Well, those are companies who do partly work with the military and partly work with civilian companies. We work with BAE and Rolls-Royce, for example, in our National Composite Centre, on lightweight materials, not on weaponry, but on things that are really important for sustainable flight, sustainable transport. I feel very comfortable about that. I also think the discussion needs to change now that we've had the war in Ukraine. So in the past, it was very easy to say we should just move out of all forms of armaments manufacture, armaments trade. Actually, without British weaponry, defensive and offensive weaponry, I do know that many of our Ukrainian refugees would feel that we had not stepped up to the plate to help them retain their homeland against a really clear aggressor. So I hope that the current situation and the complexity of it will open up a proper discussion and debate about the defense industry, how we work with companies who move between civilian and producing defensive and offensive weapons, and how we operate to ensure that we also provide understanding of diplomacy and how you can actually ensure that war doesn't happen where all too sadly it does. And a follow-up question to that, which you might have partly answered already, would you commit to arms off campus? No, um, because as I said, I think uh, I would certainly commit to nobody carrying weapons on campus. Uh, I, uh, I was born in the state of Texas, and I can tell you, you do not want a handgun carrying um, rule in this country ever. But the idea that we wouldn't have companies who were involved in manufacturing or distributing defensive weapons, um, or even in some cases, as we're talking about in Ukraine, offensive weapons is not something I would commit to. Perfectly comfortable with protests against it, as long as they are protests which allow those students and staff who want to have conversations with potential employers to take place. Each side needs to be opening to having the conversation rather than trying to shut down the conversation. Um, another question now. Thank you for that. Um, the cost of living is having a huge impact on students' daily lives, and tackling this is a key priority for our officers. Beyond the measures that have already been announced, what else is the University of Bristol going to do to support students with the cost of living crisis? So let me start by thanking both of you and the wider Students' Union for the help that you've given us 
in really making sure that we've given the right kinds of targeted support to our students here at the University of Bristol, because the cost of living crisis is real. Inflation, food inflation is real. So you've really helped us identify the kinds of things that are making a difference to students, particularly the one pound soup and roll offer in our cafes, the bring and ping um, ability, that, that sense that you know, you've really told us what the broader student community would see as genuinely helpful. And as you'll know, um, we are open to further ideas, indeed to all kinds of ideas. But for the moment, what we've done is to say, rather than spread support thinly across all students, we've decided to concentrate it through our hardship fund on those who need it most. And it's important to say that um, if you are in any form of hardship, there's no embarrassment about it. We've made the form really simple. We've worked with the Students' Union to make sure you can have the cash that you need as fast as we can possibly make it. And the other group whom we've really tried to support are our postgraduate research students, both by raising the stipend to match that of the national stipends that students get, but also by raising the amounts that we pay to our postgraduate researchers who act as tutors in our community. So we will continue to be open to ideas, to listen and to work with you. But we do think at the moment, targeting support on those who are most at risk, most in need, rather than a really thin amount spread across the entire student body is for the moment, at least, the best way around. Thank you. A follow up now. Um, you might have seen that Manchester University had committed to give each student £170. Would this be something that the University of Bristol would consider? Well, again, we're open to it, but when we looked into it, we found that the cost of that would actually leave very little to put into other kinds of programs of support. So as I was saying, for the moment, we have decided to target our support through our hardship funding on those who need it most, rather than give students who might actually be quite wealthy an extra £170. A cost question specifically for our international students now. The international student fees keep incre increasing. Why is that and what extra support are they getting? So international students are an absolute lifeblood for our university. They bring different perspectives. They create a sense of a global place um, that is the University of Bristol here in Britain, but is part of a world solving world problems. So we need to realize that international students come to Bristol for a great education, but are also looking for, for example, extra support around employability, extra support around making sure that they have housing needs met. And international students will often arrive with family, whom we also need to look after. And as we were saying before, international students may need specialist and um, uh, specialist culturally sensitive mental health and well-being support. So we do have all of that in place. Our Global Lounge is a perfect place here in um, Senate House Building. If you haven't been to the Global Lounge and you're watching this, please do come. It's not just for international students. And that staff are able to point international students to the resources that we have available. As to the question, um, why do fees keep going up every year? Well, let me be very blunt. If we could raise um, home student tuition fees every year, we probably would. Because our costs go up every year, tuition fees, home tuition fees are flat, and actually there's a big gap that's growing. So you will notice that prices don't stay still in supermarkets, nor can they stay still here in the universities. But I do think that we need to be really clear about what you as a student, what you as a student, what all the students watching us get for the tuition fees that you're either paying in cash, if you're an international student or a self-paying student, or you get in terms of taking on debt. And, and I am very pleased and happy to come and talk to any student groups about that question of what am I paying for, what am I getting? On a different note, as well as being Vice-Chancellor of the University of Bristol, 
you also have a very famous daughter. So what's it been like to watch her become so successful? Oh, terrifying. <laughs> Absolutely terrifying. And, and particularly last weekend, she broke her foot uh, on the second day of her UK tour. So she's now in a boot. She's now at home. I was able to look after her that weekend, but she is pretty gutted, pretty devastated. So it's very exciting, but as a parent, actually, you just worry all the time and you never stop worrying, even if they are a global pop star. So when she recovers from her broken foot, when can we expect Florence and the Machine to perform at Bristol? <laughs> well, she was supposed to be doing the O2. So I think perhaps when the Ashton Gate Stadium opens or wherever that big new stadium that's supposed to um, be built in Bristol. So um, when that happens, I'll see whether she can open it. Thanks. It's been great to have you here, Evelyn, and I hope our students found your answers helpful in navigating some of the complex issues surrounding higher education and what the University of Bristol are doing right now to help students. Thank you, Adam, Lucy, and everyone whom I hope is watching or will watch this conversation that we've had. You give me some great, frank, challenging questions, and I hope that I've answered frankly. I'm really pleased to be able to work with the Students' Union. We won't always agree, but we'll be a place where we can have a genuine conversation, learn from each other, and learn with our students who are the University of Bristol. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. If you as a student felt passionately about any of the topics we discussed here today, and you want to learn more about our officer priorities, head on over to Bristol SU's website where you can also learn more about the campaigns we're running, such as the cost of living and rental rights. We'll be doing more of these Bristol SU in conversations with, with other important people in Bristol's higher education community. So please let us know if there's anyone you want to hear from or if there's any burning questions. Thank you again, Evelyn and Lucy, for joining me today.